We're going to read our scripture memory verse for today. It comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 21. Say it with me. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship this morning. Congregation, let's take our Bibles this morning and uh, turn together to Matthew's Gospel. We're going to be looking at chapter 25, verse, verses 14 and following. So I want to speak to you this morning uh, using as a sub subject the stewardship of money and possessions. Many of you have been tracking through the Entrusted uh, series, and uh, today we find ourselves uh, on the topic of money. I want to ask you right up front if you will lean in uh, to what God's Word says uh, about this subject. It is a matter of life and death. In fact, did you know that the way we view and handle money reveals our true spiritual condition? Nothing else in life gives a more clear picture of our true heart and our true character than the way we view and handle money. I like to say it like this. It's the MRI of all MRIs. How many of you have ever had to have an MRI before, right? And the reason you had to have an MRI is because your doctor needed a clearer picture, did he not? Maybe the x-rays or other forms of it. He, he just needed a deeper a picture, a more accurate picture. Well, Randy Alcorn, one of my favorite authors, by the way, um, he once said this about money and possessions. He said, it is an index, or an indicator of our spiritual lives, and it becomes the story of our lives. Have you ever thought about that you're writing your story of life by the way you handle your resources? That's absolutely true. In fact, that's why money is so important to God. And did you know that uh, God actually um, has devoted more verses in the Bible to money than any other subject? In fact, you could combine all of what God says about faith and prayer, and you wouldn't be able to total up as much as he talks about money. You could total heaven and hell up, and there are more passages in the Bible on material possessions than on heaven or hell. And so I want you to, to pause for just a moment and just think about the sheer enormity of passages on this subject. And the fact that he speaks more about money than anything else should scream for our attention, and it should stress the importance of money. Now listen, a lot of people think money is just a physical issue. It's not. Money is a spiritual issue. And I want to say something even deeper. It is a gospel. It is a discipleship issue. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I thought this week, why in the world does God give so much instruction about money in the Bible? And um, I want to just suggest in an introductory uh, thought here, there's two main reasons, I believe. Number one, uh, money is a heart issue, all right? In fact, in your memory verse this week, you'll, you'll see that. But in Matthew 6, 21, look what we see. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, notice what he says here. If you locate where your money is going, you will automatically discover where your heart is. What you most love is there, right? So if you want to know what you most love in life, then look at where your what? Where your money is going. We spend our money on what we most love in life. It's just a reality. In fact, we direct our resources towards who or what we most love in life. And so as you think about it, I want you to th understand that there's a powerful relationship between our spiritual condition and our attitude and our actions concerning money. Now, let me illustrate it by using just two very, very familiar Bible uh, characters in the Scripture. First of all, how many of you remember reading the story of the rich young ruler, right? You remember that in uh, the Gospels, Jesus tells this story? Well, 
uh, there was a rich young ruler, and he came to Jesus, and he wanted to know one thing from Jesus. He says, what do I need to do to have eternal life? Remember that? And remember, Jesus looked at him, and he said, go sell everything and give everything you have to the poor. Now, just hold on. Jesus is not teaching that we have to liquidate everything. That's not what he's teaching. But in this man's case, what could Jesus see? He could see his attitude toward money. He could see that his love for money was greater than anything else. And so what was he doing? He was instructing him, okay, to break his bondage to his God. Now, what was his God? Money, the love of it. And how could he break that bondage to his God? He had to liquidate all of his assets. But what do we know from the story? He refused. Say that with me. Everybody say it loud. He refused. You know what? The rich young ruler is not the only one um, that refuses. But here's what. In his refusal, what do we see? We see the true spiritual condition of his what? Of his heart. And we see that. And tragically... The rich young ruler's God was money. And therefore, when Jesus told him to break that bondage by liquidate, he refused it altogether. Now, I want you to contrast. Now, let me just, well, let me just ask this question. Is money just a physical issue? No, it's not. It's a spiritual issue. Right? And we see that with the rich young ruler. Now, let's contrast the rich young ruler with another very familiar Bible character. His name was... Zacchaeus. Now, who was Zacchaeus? He was a, come on, wee little, he was a wee little man, right? Right? We grew up on this story, right? Remember, he had an encounter with Jesus. And after having his encounter with Jesus, the Bible says that willingly, on his own, he sold his possessions and he gave half of it away to the poor. And, listen carefully, he repaid everyone that he cheated. Now, what does that reveal about his heart? Zacchaeus had had a change of what? A change of heart. And as a result of his actions related to money, what did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? This is interesting. He said this, Today salvation has come to your house. Did you hear that? Money is a gospel issue. It is a spiritual issue. His attitude, his actions, the way he responded to Christ, it involved his money. And that action demonstrated that he had had a real life change. He had got saved that day. And so, congregation, our true spiritual condition is related, whether we want to admit it or not, to our attitude and toward our actions toward money. And and I think here's what Jesus would say to us. Don't be deceived. Christ cannot be Lord of your life if he's not also Lord over your money. Now, I want that to settle for just a moment. He just can't be. You you can't say he's Lord of my life and he not be Lord over your what? Your material possessions. It's just impossible. There's no need really to argue. So, congregation... Uh, Listen, God has more to say about money because it's a spiritual issue. It really is a matter of life and death, eternal life and death. But then there's a second reason I think that Jesus has a lot to say about money, and here it is, because money is dangerous. I want you to say that with me out loud. I know. Ready? Money is dangerous. Now, I know you're thinking, well, wait a minute. I don't think it's dangerous. I like it. It's dangerous. Listen to me. Jesus says this in Matthew 19, 24. He says, I'll say it again. It is easier for a camel, you know how big a camel is, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, what is Jesus saying there? He's saying it is harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God Period. Notice what it does not say. It does not say um, that uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the avenue than for a rich person who loves his money. No, it doesn't have who loves his money. It just says it is harder for a rich person to what? To enter the kingdom of God. Well, you say, well, wait, 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 wait. The Bible says... 
The love of money is the root of all evil. It sure does. But the Bible also says money's dangerous. In fact, if you are here this morning and you have a lot of it, and I know none of you think you have a lot of it, but in just a couple of weeks I'll be in Southeast Asia and I'll be talking to a group of people that only have one fraction of what you have. <laughs> Like, this is the richest group. But like, in America, we are the very wealthy people. But listen, if you have money, okay, listen carefully. If you have it and you depend on it, it will kill you. If you don't have it and yet you crave it, it will also kill you. Money can kill us. You say, well, what do you mean? How can it kill us spiritually? It can enable us to live independently from God. Like, we can live very self-sufficiently as long as we have money. This is why it is so, so dangerous. It enables us to live our life without God, without depending upon Him. This is why it is so dangerous. And so here's my point to you this morning. The stewardship of money is a serious matter. It is a matter of spiritual life and spiritual death. We see that in the rich young ruler. We see that in the story of Zacchaeus. And so God desires for us to give it serious attention, right? And I want you to lean in this morning and give this some serious attention. Now, let me, let's look at our passage together. In Matthew chapter 25, many of you are, are, are probably aware that in chapter 24, Jesus is speaking his final words to his disciples before his death. And he tells them that he's getting ready to go away, but he's coming back. How many of you know this morning that God, Jesus Christ, is returning? And he tells them in chapter 24, there are a lot of signs of his returning so that they are ready and so that they are prepared and so that they don't miss his return. Well, in chapter 25, he gives us three parables, and they're called kingdom parables. And the first parable is the parable of the ten virgins. And there were five bridesmaids who were prepared when the bridegroom came, and there were five who were not prepared, right? And they were left out. And the whole purpose of that first parable is Jesus is saying, listen, it's going to be a long time before I come back, but it's going to be sudden, and everyone better be prepared. And he's revealing to us that a lot of people are not going to be prepared when he comes back. That's what he teaches us in the first parable. In the second parable, it's called the parable of the talents. He's saying, while I am gone, right, there's a specific way I want you to live. I am coming back, and when I come back, I'm going to hold you accountable for everything you've done with what I've given you. But here's what Jesus is teaching us in this parable. Are you ready? He's saying, while I am gone, invest your resources in me. That's what he's saying. Let me give you a bigger main idea, and we're going to walk through the text together. We are entrusted with and will be accountable for making wise use of our money and possessions. I need you to understand, you will one day give a personal account for everything God has placed into your hands, including the money that you've made by the sweat of your brow, including the inheritance you have received from your family. God is going to hold you accountable for that, right? He, listen, and, and let me just say it like this. Saving faith in Christ will manifest itself in good stewardship. All right? Now, let's just walk through this parable together. Look with me at verse 14. He says, again, it will be like a man. Now, who, what is he referring to? What is the it? The return of Jesus. Again, the return of Jesus will be like a man going on a journey. Now, this is a man is pointing to Jesus. Jesus has come. He's died. Has, he's paid our penalty for sin and death. He's risen from the grave, and he's ascended back to the Father, and he's promised us to come. So he's gone on a journey, and he's called his servants and entrusted his property, his wealth, to them. Verse 15, to one he gave five talents. And let me just stop here for a moment and explain to you what a talent is. A talent is a measure, a weight of gold or silver. 
One talent would be, it'd be like uh, Jesus giving you a bag of gold, and in that bag, you would have enough to live 20 years of your life. How many of you would like Jesus to give you 20 years of wages right now? Well, with this first guy, Jesus gives him 100 years of wages. He's got enough money in his bag to live 100 years. And the scripture goes on to say that the other one, he got two talents. And then another one talent. And then it says, each according to his ability. So God has given us, entrusted certain uh, resources into us based on our ability. And then it says, then he went on his journey. Let Let me ask you, has Jesus gone on his journey? He's not physically walking around here anymore. This, is a, this story is about him, and it's about us. So Christ has come. He's died. He's gone back to glory. He's promised his return, and he's saying, okay, here are my assets. Here are my possessions. I'm giving them to you, and, now, and then he returns. He leaves, okay? He goes on this journey, all right? Verse 16, the man who had received the five talents went at once. Notice how immediately he began to do what? Expand that which God had given him. Listen, look, we don't have time to sit on our can, right? We, we, he, he went at once and put his money to work, and he gained five more. Well, that's production, isn't it? That's expansion. Remember from a few weeks ago, I said part of being a steward is that we protect and we what? We expand God's resources. That's what it means to be a steward. And that's what this man does here. He says, so also the one with two talents, verse 17, gained two more. Verse 18, but the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Do you see there's a contrast between the first two servants, right, and the last servant? Right? These first two servants recognize everything they have come from God, and they immediately begin to do what? They begin to work, to expand, to produce, right? And then and, and versus the one who, who does nothing, he goes and he digs a hole and he plants it in a hole, fearful that he's going to lose it. Verse 19, it says, after a long time, listen. In one way, it's going to be a long time before Jesus is returned. That's, that's what he's taught us in the first parable. In another way, it's going to be very surprising and shocking, and suddenly it's going to happen. So we've got to be prepared. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts. So you've got two who've done a lot for God, and you've got one who's done nothing with God. But they all were given and entrusted resources by God. And so he comes and he returns to settle accounts with him. By the way, there's going to be a settling of your account in your future. Verse 20, the man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. Well, that's uh, production, isn't it? His master replied, listen to these words, well done. How many of you want to hear those words? Good, that's speaking to his character. And faithful, that's speaking to his loyalty and commitment to living and serving his master. Well done, good, godly, and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things come and share your master's happiness i want you to notice three things there is affirmation there is promotion and there's celebration does the master affirm this servant the answer is yes does he promote him yes he gives him more and does he invite him to a great celebration Yes, come enjoy the master's happiness. Look at verse 22. The man with the two talents, this is servant number two, had uh, also came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents, and see, I have gained two more. His re- master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Let me ask you, is there aff- affirmation here? Yes, there is. Is there promotion here? Yes. Is there celebration? Absolutely. All those things are right 
there. Come and share your master's habit. Then look at verse 24. Everything changes, the shift in the story. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. And I want you to stop right there. Does he know the God that we know? Is God a hard master? No. He's demonstrating he's in church, he's religious, but he doesn't know God. He says, I knew you are a hard man, harvesting where you haven't sown. In other words, you're not even, you're not even fair, and gathering where you've not even scattered seed. You, 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 you take from other people. He's accusing him of being not just unfair, but unjust. This is not the God that we serve. Amen? How many of you know sometimes our knowledge about God doesn't always align up with what the Scriptures testify about who God is? And then look at verse 25. Because he didn't know the one true God. He said, so I was afraid. Now notice those first two servants, they were motivated by love to be faithful. But this servant right here is what? Crippled by fear. And he doesn't do anything for God. The Scripture says, it's, it's incredible. He says, so I was afraid and went out and hid your, your talent. I will give him one thing. He recognizes that the, the money bag that God gave him was God's. I'll give him that. He put it in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. In other words, my life has been useless since you gave me this. For the kingdom. Look at verse 28. Take the talent from him. That's not affirmation, is it? And give, that's, and give it to one who has the ten talents. That's demotion. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. And then look at verse 30. These are some very, very war warning verses, words. He says, and throw that worthless servant, that fake servant, Outside into the darkness where there will be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where did the five bridesmaids go in the first parable that weren't ready? They missed their opportunity. Where does this one servant go? Eternal separation from God. And so, congregation, do you see the value of stewarding the money? and possessions that God puts in your hands. So here's what I want to do. I want to just give you four simple practical steps of how you can be a good steward. Are you ready? Number one, we must understand and adopt God's view of money and possessions. This is so important. Congregation, if you don't have God's view on sexuality, you're going to be in big trouble. If you don't have God's view on marriage, you're going to be in big trouble. And if you don't have God's view on morality, you're going to be in big trouble. If you don't have God's view on money and material possessions, I'm telling you, you're going to be in big, big trouble. It's important for us to have a biblical mindset. And so, real quickly, I want to give you three simple things. Money and possessions belong to God, and we're only stewards of His resources. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's. And everything in it. Now let me ask you a question. How much is everything? Everything. Where do we get everything that we have? From God's earth. Where did you get the gas to put in your car? From God's earth. What about the aluminum that your car is made out of? Where did it come from? It came from minerals and resources from where? From God's earth. Everything we have, everything that we make, ultimately comes from who? It comes from God. And if we don't understand that, we'll begin to think about uh, life and our possessions in terms of ownership. In fact, a scientist without something to work with is a powerless spectator. Right? Right? 
I mean, th- there's no scientist that can create anything unless he, where do we get the medicines that we take? We get them from the minerals and resources of our, of God's earth, not our earth. So listen, God is owner. Are you ready? I'm going to shock some of you. Here we go. God is owner and you are his bank. And some of you are like, I've always wanted to be a bank. You are. You're God's bank. You say, wait a minute. No, I, I work for this. No, God, God gave you the ability to work for that. You're God's bank. So that means God has made deposits into your management. And we now are stewards and we're called to expand his kingdom while he is away. He's coming back. But while he's away, this is the way we are to live. And we are to use what God has given us, not to live for ourselves, but to what? To build his kingdom. Haggai chapter 2 verse 8 says this. It says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's army. Never, never view money. And material things as you own them, they they all belong to God. In fact, God can put holes in your pocket. And you say, no, 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 you don't understand. I worked overtime for this. I'm going to do what I want to do with this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17, verse 17 and 18 says, You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. How many of you have ever heard someone say, or you said it yourself, you know what? I work for this. This is my money. This is Moses speaking to the Israelites before they go into the promised land. And remember, Moses knows that they're getting ready to go into a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses knows that, listen, they're getting ready to eat <laughs> like they've never eaten before. They're getting ready to gain some weight big time. And they're going to build nice houses. They're going to enjoy prosperity. The blessings of God are going to flow on them. And look what he says. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to build your house, the ability to buy your car, the ability to produce what? To produce wealth. He warns them, and he's warning us, God is warning us today to guard our hearts from living self-sufficient and independent from God in our lives. He warns us to be on guard against that. So congregation, money and possessions belong to God. We're only stewards. Number two, I want you to see this. Money and possessions cannot produce security and true happiness. Some of you don't believe this. You're still living in bondage because you don't believe this. But listen to what the Bible says. In Proverbs 18, 11, he says, the rich think their wealth protects them. They imagine themselves themselves safe behind it and what is solomon reminding us don't be deceived right money and possessions can be very deceptive in our lives in fact there are some situations that we get into life right that our money ain't going to help us one bit right absolutely not so money simply cannot shield you from all problems It's not the source of your safety. It's not the source of your happiness and security. And this is why Paul, speaking to the young Timothy, he warns him about this and he calls for contentment. Look at this passage, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 7. Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great what? Just keep driving your car. You don't need a second house. You don't need more. You don't need bigger. Because if you desire more and bigger, guess what it's going to do? <laughs> it's going to put you into bondage. It's going to weigh you down. It's going to become a source of anxiety and even depression in your own life. And he's saying, you, you learn to live with what? With little. Be content with what you have. True happiness, Paul would say, 
is not the accumulation of money and possessions. True happiness, okay, living a life free of anxiety and free from all this emotional stress is learning to be content with what? Our car with 200,000 miles on it. A house where you have to share a bedroom or your kids have to share a bedroom. That's the source of happiness and safety and security. And then there's a third thing, real quickly. Money and possessions have great potential to master us. Now, church, I really want you to lean in. And young people, I want you to hear me. If you have the wrong attitude toward money, it will control you. It will master you. And listen, Jesus has amazing words to say about this Matthew 6 24 he says you can't worship two gods at once loving one God you will end up hating the other adoration of one feeds contempt for the other and look at this last statement you can't worship God and what isn't it interesting Jesus could have said a lot of things. He says, you can't worship God in what? He could have said popularity. He, he, he could have said uh, a lot of things, all right? But what does he say? He says money. Why money? Because here's the reason. Money enables us. Money enables us to live for ourselves. To do what we want. When we want, where we want, why we want, how we want. If I've got enough money, I can live my life the way I want to live it. I can be my own little G God. How many of you recognize this guy that's going to pop up on the screen behind me? How many of you recognize this guy's picture? This is one of the saddest guys in the world to me. They call him Mr. Wonderful. His name is Kevin O'Leary. He's one of the sharks on the shark tank. And this is what he says over and over to people in front of him wanting him to invest. He says, show me the money. And if you don't, you are dead to me. And so he says over and over, show me the money. Listen, uh, recently he made this statement, this quote. Can't read the quote, can you? Well, let me read it carefully to you. It's on the back screen really pretty. Um, are you ready? Here's what he says. You may lose your wife. You may lose your dog. Your mother may hate you. None of those things matter. Do you see why I feel like he's... He's in a bad place. I'm so sad for him. What matters is that you achieve success. And in his eyes, success is what? It's money. What matters is that you achieve success and become free. He doesn't know what free is. He's so much in bondage, he doesn't understand freedom. And then look, this is the most dangerous, this is the most awful statement I think I've ever read or heard. He says, then... You can do whatever you like. The reason Jesus says you can't serve God in money. Because money is what we go after when we really want to be our own God. Now, I'm going to just break it down for you. Some of you want to live somewhere that God doesn't want you to live. But you're still planning on going to live there. Some of you want to spend your retirement in places that God doesn't want you to spend your retirement, but you're still set on going there. Do you hear me what I'm saying? And because you're set on doing something that you want to do, you, you, right now you're, you, you've got to go get after it, and you are slave to that. And what I want you to see is that money and possessions has this type of potential to master us. Listen, whenever you watch Shark Tank, look, you have to feel sorry for this guy. This guy is under the control of, of money in a big way. 
in a big way. And so number one, we've, we've got to think the way God thinks about money. And I've given you three. There's so much more in Scripture. And sometimes I'm like, how can I not share this? And how can I not share that? But I've given you three foundational things. Young people, listen to you. If you're just starting out your marriage, you're starting out your family, these three things are foundational for you to build your life on. But then secondly, you've got to transfer the ownership of your life over to God. And this includes your money. Now listen, through the years I have been counseling and, and, and working with people, and this is where people get tripped up. They'll say to me, well, Pastor Ann, I believe everything belongs to God, but I can't live that way. And I say to them, your first step toward freedom, financial freedom, is to transfer the ownership of your money over to God. And this is a spiritual decision that every one of us have to make if we're going to stewardship well. And look, I, I'll agree with you, this is very hard because from very early on in our life, here's what we're taught, okay? As a young toddler, we're said, this is your toy. We're, we're taught, this is my toy. This, this is a good one. This is my room. I remember when my kids were young, they would say, Get out of my room. And I would walk by and say, which room did you say was yours? This house is my house. This farm is my farm. This life is my life. This money is my money. This car is my car. Look, we, we've been trained to think ownership. And that's why we have to transfer ownership back because many of us have been living as owners. I love in 1 Chronicles 29, David is raising money to build the temple, the house of God. And look what he says. He says, but who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Like, who are we to give anything to God who owns it all? And then he says, everything we have has come from you. How many of you have ever given anything to God that wasn't already God's? You've given nothing. He says, everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. Look, this is the way you approach your tithe. You give God the first tenth of your increase because it all belongs to him anyway. And by the way, he said in Leviticus 19 that it's holy, it belongs to him. If we keep it, we're stealing, we're robbing what rightfully belongs to him. We give back to him what already belongs to him. And look, we fight and we wrestle with God about giving because we want to believe that we're owners. And we're not owners. You say, where did this start? The Garden of Eden. God said, you can eat and enjoy, and you can touch every tree in this garden but this one. He said, don't touch it. He didn't just say, don't eat from it. He said, don't touch it. It don't belong to you. I ain't giving it to you. And you know what? They looked at that thing. They said, you know what? We own the rest of it. Let's own that too. We, we're not satisfied with just being a manager. We, 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 we won't own it all. Who's he think he is telling us that we can't touch it, right? And you see, they rejected being stewards, and they wanted to be what? Owners, and so they took of the fruit. And so this morning, hopefully when you came in, if you didn't get one, you can get one as you leave. There's a little card here called the transfer of title. And I'm going to ask you to give serious consideration this afternoon reading this and signing it. And it just simply says, I hereby acknowledge God's ownership of me and all my money and everything that I have, including my children. Listen, your children and grandchildren don't belong to you. If you start thinking about your children as yours, you're in a big, big, big trouble. You're in big trouble. In fact, when they're not acting good, you say, God, your kids are just driving me crazy, right? From this point forward, I will think of these assets as his to do what he wishes. I will do my utmost to ask him and prayerfully consider how he wishes me to invest his assets to further his kingdom. In doing so, I realize I will surrender certain temporary earthly treasures, but I will gain and exchange eternal treasures as well as increased perspective and decreased anxiety. It's right there on your card. I keep this card in my Bible. 
to remind me that I don't want anything. It's an act of faith that requires commitment. And then thirdly, congregation, we must keep good financial records and live by a budget that's realistic and biblically based. I want to say two things here. We need to maintain an inventory of what God has given us. That means you just simply write down all your assets. You know what? If you did that this afternoon, every one of us would be saying, Whew, I forgot I own that. I forgot. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And then you start singing, count your many blessings, see what God has. I mean, like sometimes we live as if we have nothing and God has given us a lot. So you just, you just write out on a piece of paper what you have. Uh, Solomon says this in Proverbs. He says, riches can disappear fast. Someone say, amen. They can, and the king's crown doesn't stay in his family forever. So watch your business interests closely. This is scripture now. And he says, know the state of your what? Solomon is talking to herdsmen. Know how many sheep you have. Know what's in your 401k. Understand what God has put into your hands because it's that that you're going to be held accountable for. And if we don't have an inventory, we don't have a, just a simple list, this is what God's given me, I'm just writing it on the side, like we, we'll live as if we don't have we, none of that. We're not going to have to give an account for investing that in kingdom work. And, and so step number one is keep good records, and that starts with you just writing down what God has put into your management. Okay. Secondly, you've got to plan your spending. You need a budget. You say, what is a budget? It's just planning your spending. It's telling your money where to go whether and whether versus wondering where your money went. How many of you sometimes are like, where did my money go? Well, this is why you need a budget. And you need a budget that's both realistic, but it's also biblically based. What do I mean by that? Realistic, you can't have this much income and this much expense. <laughs> it's not realistic. It's not financially sustainable. Okay? That's really, what do I mean by Biblical. A biblical budget puts God first. So right underneath the income, your first thing is my giving. You say, well, you know what? I, I give God what I've got left over. Can I just invite you to uh, turn your mind with me back to the first murder in the Bible? Everybody got it? It's Cain and Abel. Adam had taught them how they were to approach God. And they were to bring him an offering. And in Genesis 4, it says that Cain was a, was a, a farmer and he brought some, it says, some crop from his field. But Abel was a herdsman and he brought the first portion. So the first calf that was born, we taken him to God. Okay, but that's not what Cain did. Cain was like, okay, have we got all the wheat up in that field? Have we got all the wheat up in that field? And hey, let's make sure that we got enough for uh, the next two years. And then what do we got left over? Oh, oh yeah, we're going to take some of that to God. Abel gave of his first fruits. Cain gave of leftovers. God rejected Cain's offering. Cain got and accepted Abel's. And this, guess what happened? Cain got mad and jealous toward Abel and in, look, listen, listen, planned his murder, lured him out into the fields and smashed his head up against a rock, killing him. Since that moment, man has always wanted to decide what he gives God. And they don't want to listen to what God says you are to give me. That's the problem today. Many of us are giving God leftovers. And God's not honored by that. In fact, giving God the first part of our income, whether, whatever it is, is a way that we honor him and, and demonstrate that we trust him first and foremost to take care of us. And we're honoring him. 
And so we need a budget, and that budget needs to be biblically based. And by the way, there are resources to help you. Crown Financial Ministries, uh, Ramsey Solutions, these are, these are people that are willing to come alongside of you. There are people in our church that um, would love to help you. But listen, I want you to hear me. Proverbs 21.5 says, plan carefully and you will have plenty. You say, wait a minute, I don't believe that. The only way I'm going to have a plenty is I got to make more. I'm here to tell you the problem is not we need to make more. The problem is we need to spend less. And I wish our federal government would learn. But listen, before you criticize the federal government, look at your own budget. Budgets help us control our spending. It prevents wasteful spending. It helps us direct our resources where God wants them to go. And listen, here's the cool thing about a budget. It will always help you find some extra money. Anybody want to find an extra $100? Well, do a budget and follow it. I guarantee you, you'll find an extra $100 a month. So a biblical-based budget is your roadmap to responsible stewardship. And look, I know some of you are thinking, you know, I've tried. Look, I have struggled through my years. I have struggled with this. Can I just tell you, don't give up. Get coaching. Ask someone to come alongside of you and help you. Budget together with your spouse. Do you, do you know, through the years, I've discovered that Sometimes spouses don't know what the other spouse is doing. And sometimes that leads to deception. And there's been times where I'm talking senior adult type age people have discovered that they've had credit card debts that they knew nothing about mounting over $50,000 simply because they didn't do their, they did not do their finances together. Dad, you got to do that. You and your wife got to do that together. You shouldn't do it separate. It should be all out in the open, and you work, and you plan, and you pray together. That's what a responsible budget looks like in your life. And so you got to take responsibility. And then, look, here's the final thing. We've got to invest our money and our possessions in eternal purposes. This is why your memory verse this uh, week comes from Matthew 6, 19. It says, don't store up yourself for your treasures here on earth. Can I just tell you? I want to stop. Everything you got, someone else is getting ready to get it. <laughs> Including the house you live in. Everything. And Jesus says, if you store up for things on earth. In other words, you work to build stuff that's going to rot. Moss, eat them. Rust, destroys them. Thieves break in and steal. They're not... They're not safe and secure. But he says, there's a different way of living. Store your treasures in heaven. Invest in the king and his kingdom. I read this verse and I think Jesus is saying, please stop acting like this is your home. We're pilgrims, not settlers. How many of you are glad that our citizenship is in heaven? So why are we building for earth? If we're going to follow Jesus, we can't spend our time stockpiling for earthly temporal things. We have to put our resources in kingdom ministry. This is why Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 18, he says, Tell them to use their money to do good. Now, who's Paul? Paul is telling Timothy, who's the pastor of Ephesus, he says, Go tell your church, tell all of them when they gather to hear you preach, Use their money to do good. Be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. I was trying to summarize all my notes this week on this. And by the way, just, just to tell you, I had to cut down my sermon about 100 times just to get it within a 40-minute piece. There's so much to say, but I, I boiled it down to four statements that might help you. Give cheerfully. Now, in other words, give to accomplish God's work. Spend reasonably. Yes, I know, I know you've got personal needs, and I know, yes, 
but you don't need 50 pairs of shoes, I promise you. I promise you, you just don't need that many pairs of shoes. I'm not going to the pocketbook thing. It's just, it, we'll leave that there. <laughs> Save strategically. There are future needs that you need to be saving and putting aside. And then you ready for the last one? This is a big one. Entrust carefully. One of the last things that you get to do on this earth is direct what God has given you to manage to someone else to manage after you're gone. Do you know the vast majority of Christians in the church don't have a will? Here's what they say. State can handle it. The state can't handle anything. Plan your estate. Remember the Lord's work. Be a good steward with everything that God has enabled you to either inherit. Some people say, well, you know, I didn't earn this. I inherited it. Who do you think put you in that family? God put you in that family. Just so for such a time as this, you could step up and invest in the kingdom. I wrote in my notes as I finished up this week just one statement. I want to leave it with you. If I had to just kind of put this entire parable in one statement, here it is. This is Jesus speaking to us. He's saying, invest your life in me. Saving faith, invest its life and money and possessions in the kingdom. Don't tell me the way you handle money don't make a difference because there are two servants in this parable that enjoy the master's happiness. And there's another one that reveals that his heart really was not there. He didn't really know God. And guess where he spends eternity in everlasting darkness. So someday, God is going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? Please don't say, no one told me. I am here today on behalf of God to say to you, prepare for that day. It's a personal accounting. No excuses, no debates. Here it is. Are you serving Christ with what he's given you for the short time that you get to do it? Now, I don't know about you, but I think in a message like this, there's a plenty of spaces for repentance in my life. And if you're feeling the weight of conviction, I want you to understand that's a good thing. And listen. My invitation for you this morning to you is the same one that I've taken all week. And that is repent. Just admit to God that you've not done this and you haven't thought this way and you want to think this way. You want to do something different. And, and you're saying, God, you're telling me my next step is this and I'm going to step out and do that. And by, by the way, there, there are two books that have really changed my life on this. And, and I, I, I'll be glad to get you this. But. Here they are, if they'll pop up on the screen. My favorite author of all times, Randy Alcorn. You read these two books. These two books here take everything that this says about money and breaks it down for you to understand it. And by the way, I'd have to preach for five years to preach all of it. It's a big deal. You say, well, no, it doesn't matter. It's just a physical issue. Then explain the rich young ruler to me. It could be this morning in this room someone has discovered that they need Jesus Christ because the reality is God has shown you that you love money more than you love God. And so my invitation is for you just to agree with God with whatever he's putting on your heart and then listen, don't let shame or guilt get in the way for next steps we are a family 
and we are here to encourage and help and walk and nothing you've done or not done is too bad for us to love you we're gonna love you and work with you. amen that's the family in your small group i hope you have that so close relationship with people where you can reach out look there are people that god has here to coach after the first service this morning an older man, 80, over, over 80, hung around to speak to me. And he called out a name of someone sitting in this room right here. He said, this man saved my life in this area. The coaching that this man gave me saved my life. And he referred back to his past and he began to talk about. And I said, isn't it awesome how God provides people to walk alongside of us when we need them amen so if that's you this morning don't feel guilty just come to the lord repent take those next steps let's pray together <clears throat> father god we sometimes are overwhelmed and how short we fall in our thinking. And sometimes, Lord, we realize our thinking has caused us to act in ways that are not healthy. So, God, we want to just repent of wrong thinking this morning. Forgive us for believing things about money that the world has taught us. Help us to learn to think like you think on this. And I pray that you enable us to make that spiritual commitment to transfer ownership to live by a budget that's biblically based and to invest in the king and his kingdom. We need you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.